This brings us to the very last session of the uh, 2017 um, summer school. And this session will be a little unusual. It will not be just me speaking, but we will also have representatives from the winning teams of the Malmo Collaborative um, AI Challenge. I'm very excited to be able to hear about their approaches um, in the end of this session. But first of all, um, I will give a brief introduction of the uh, Malmo platform and our long-term goals, um, why we built this platform. I will introduce the Malmo Collaborative AI Challenge and give you a sense of the task that uh, teams had to address there. And then I switch over to uh, Sean, who will be um, introducing the teams and their, uh, who will discuss their approaches. So Project Malmo, you have very briefly at least heard about this yesterday during the dinner um, when we uh, presented the awards uh, to this team. Project Malmo is a platform that uh, my team and myself have developed here in the Cambridge Lab over the past two years. We open sourced this platform about a year ago. So if this is something that you think um, is exciting that you could um, potentially use for your research or use to learn about um, various AI techniques, for example, reinforcement learning, then this is something that you can download right now. It comes with a, a bunch of examples that especially uh, Dave there has uh, put a lot of time in developing. It comes with tutorials. So this is something ready to try today. But why did we feel the need for developing an experimentation platform for artificial intelligence? And why did we select the game Minecraft as the platform or as the basis for that particular platform? The long-term aim of my research and a lot of um, um, people in the community is to develop AI technology that allows us to address real-world applications. Now, when we move towards real-world applications, there's typically a problem that it's usually expensive, difficult, or dangerous to actually do experiments in those real-world settings that we're addressing in the long term. So there's often this need that we need to come up with, for example, a, a laboratory environment or a simulated environment in which we can test out and uh, refine our ideas until we have a good understanding of how they work and we can actually translate them into real-world applications. Now I see computer games, video games, as one particularly interesting and important environment for setting up those kinds of simulations. And because in many important respects, they are able to capture some aspects of real world interactions while also abstracting from some of those characteristics that make real world exp uh, experiments expensive, dangerous, or very difficult. The reason we selected Minecraft is that it particularly incorporates some of those characteristics that we are particularly interested in in the research and where we also hope to encourage the research community to look at those particular problems. And there are just three of those aspects that I want to mention and emphasize here and there are others um, as well. The first aspect is that in the real world we have a wide range, a wide variety of tasks and goals that we are trying to achieve and that we would like AI technologies to be able to address. But at the same time, those sets of tasks and problems are typically not some loose random collection of things that we throw at, um, for example, people or the AI technologies that we want um, to be able to solve them. Instead, those problems are typically related according to some rules, to some, you could say, common sense regularities that we find in the real world. For example, typically in real world environments, we have 3D geometry, we have certain spatial regularity that is very important. And all that information, that, in, uh, that regularity, are things that we can put as inductive bias into the solutions that we develop. And using those effectively typically allows us to speed up learning. So by developing an experimentation platform on top of Minecraft, we are able to use a world in which there is this um, rich but also regular structure. There is a physics in Minecraft that is not identical to real world physics, of course, but if you have played Minecraft before, you know that you cannot put water in uh, thin air, that sand falls down, that when water and lava meet, they form obsidian, etc., etc. So there are all these rules, all those regularities that can be exploited and built upon when an agent or when an AI agent is trying to learn to solve a new task. 
in addition to that, what we were looking for was an environment that could support a wide range of um, ideas and approaches. And this is something where Minecraft plays a very interesting role, for example, in the sense that it um, provides a world in which, for example, there is a natural way of discretizing or in some way characterizing the world in, so in many different ways. And just to give you an example here, um, the uh, platform that we have built does not presuppose that people use, for example, reinforcement learning. You can use um, planning or other classic AI approaches. But just to give you examples from the reinforcement learning um, literature, this is something that I'm particularly familiar with. You can, for example, construct tasks that are very similar to a kind of classic discrete state, discrete action types of reinforcement learning tasks where an agent um, represents the world for example, by those squares, those individual enumerable states that it can encounter as it, um, as, as it explores the world and interacts with it. Um, and at the same time, we can move to a different space of observation. So for example, the agent could also observe the, the video image um, of the world from a first person perspective. Um, so we provide a platform where there are these different observation handlers that give different types of observations to the agent. There are different kinds of command handlers. And by using those, we can create problems that are specifically targeted at the technology that we are trying to explore. And it also allows us to start combining techniques in novel ways. And I think moving forward, combining, combining ideas from, for example, different communities has a lot of potential of helping us address um, interesting problems in the future. Finally, one area that I am particularly excited about is this area of learning to collaborate and communicate with other agents. And in the long term, the kinds of agents that I would want our AI agents to communicate with are people. So in the long run, we are aiming to develop technology that can collaborate with people, empower them, and assist them in achieving the goals that they are looking for. So for those kinds of problems, um, creating environments where tasks are based on collaboration and communication is really important. And the platform that we have developed comes ready-made for those kinds of challenges. So for example, at the top here, there's a screenshot of a task where two agents are collaborating to solve a maze. In the lower run, there's a very simple example of uh, bringing a natural language component into a task. So these are all capabilities that are all already provided by the platform. And the platform is very generic in the way that it allows you to create a new task using a simple XML format, putting on some reward structure or some other information that should be provided to the agent. And you're ready and can go about focusing on experimenting with the agent rather than investing an enormous amount of time in setting up some kind of new simulation or some laboratory setting in which to run the experiments. Now, after this very brief overview of um, Project Malmo, I want to switch to the Malmo Collaborative AI Challenge. And as we mentioned before, the Malmo Collaborative AI Challenge was a challenge that we run for the first time this year. And we set this up with the goal of fostering research in especially collaborative AI. So in developing, modeling, or training AI agents that can learn to collaborate with others. Um, this challenge was open to participating teams of graduate students worldwide, and I believe uh, Sean will uh, tell you more about the uh, participants that we actually had. Um, it ran in April and May 2017 of this year, and we awarded, we were able to award two sets of prizes to the winning teams, and those decisions were announced uh, in June just about a month ago. There were two sets of prizes. One set of prizes were attendance for, for the winning teams of the AI, AI Summer School right here. So it's uh, our great pleasure to welcome those winning teams um, here at the Summer School. And the second set of prizes was an Azure for Research grant. And like uh, Shimon mentioned earlier in his talk, this is a large amount of um, compute resource that we hope will allow the winning teams to take, take their approaches further, invest more in their research, and come up with novel new ideas and insights. In the remaining few slides of my talk, I want to briefly walk you through the uh, challenge task and motivate in which way this is particularly 
um, challenging and interesting, and how it captures some of the key challenges that we need to address in developing collaborative AI agents. And luckily for me, Shimon has already motivated some of the difficulties in multi-agent scenarios. So this goes very much back to these um, questions around uh, games from a game theoretic perspective. The task that we formulated here starts from the classic formulation, the classic game theoretic formulation that is known as the stack hunt. And you can see the classic formulation there. This type of game was first described by Jean-Jacques Rousseau to uh, capture some um, ideas, some kind of challenges in working out social dilemmas around deciding whether to cooperate and coordinate or whether to go for your own um, reward or safety. So the way this, go, this is typically set up is that there are several hunters who go on a stack hunt. If they um, want to catch a stack, they need to collaborate because it's a very large prey. If they manage to collaborate successfully, they all get a high reward. So in this example of two hunters, let's say there could be a value of five if everyone, um, to everyone who uh, co coordinates in catching the stack. Alternatively, each hunter could try to catch a hare, which is easier to catch, can be caught by an individual, but has a smaller, um, has a smaller payoff. Um, if everyone catches a hare, they each get a reward, which is fairly safe, but it's smaller than that of coordination. Now, the uh, conflict arises because if one agent is trying to coordinate while the other is going for the hare, then the agent that is uh, then, then the agent that is trying to coordinate and collaborate will actually be empty-handed, so they will get a reward of zero. And so this creates this tension of trying to estimate what the other um, um, agent might do. There are two pure Nash equilibrium uh, equilibria here in this um, um, mix sum game. One is where both coordinate. One is where both go for the hair. And then there's also a mixed strategy that that. Um, uh, uses various percentages uh, or various probabilities for, for one or the other. Now, the variant of this game that we based our task on was this extended version of the stack hunt that was proposed by uh, Yoshida and colleagues in 2008. And I particularly like this um, form of the game because it extends it with some various aspects around um, understanding how to coordinate with another agent. And one um, aspect that they were particularly interested in in studying is what they call the theory of mind. And this is this idea that if you want to um, compute your optimal strategy, then you need to know some information about the other agent's information state. So you need to know what, they, what the other, you need to reason about the other agent's strategy in order to counter with an effective strategy of your own. And this creates, again, this uh, recursive dilemma of reasoning about what they know, what you know, what they know, et cetera, et cetera. Also, this um, uh, formulation introduces an interesting aspect of signaling, which you could see as some kind of language. So for example, if um, I'm the uh, green agent down here at the bottom, and I move, uh, let's say, to the right, then the red agent could infer that as a signal that you are trying to move towards the stack, that you are trying to be cooperative. So then you can have this additional dimension where you try to interpret the other agent's actions in a way that allows you to gain additional information about their strategy. So it's an interesting form of communication that doesn't require natural language per se. Now, our formulation of the task was a translation of this um, game theoretic stack hunt problem into the Minecraft world. You can see here the uh, interface that we provide for human players to play the game. So you can actually try this, try this out. Again, this is uh, something where we provided the task and the uh, baseline starter code on GitHub. So if you would like to play around with those kinds of tasks, you can download this and try it out. Um, we provide two kinds of observations to the human player. And for the AI agents, um, teams were also free to choose one or the other. The first one is a first-person uh, perspective, which creates this very difficult problem of having uh, to deal with partial observability. The other one is a more global um, observation where you see a top-down view um, of the current agent. So here, 
I would be the red agent. I could see the pink and the blue agent um, position there. And then my goal would be to pick a strategy that allows me to um, either catch the pig by cornering or pinching it, or I could go for safety, go to one of the exit squares on the left or to the right, and get the small reward by abandoning my, my potential collaborator. Um, the task was set up in a turn-taking fashion, so each agent would um, act one after the other. However, the pig was maintained with normal Minecraft dynamics, so it could suddenly start to run around. And there might be strategies, for example, in waiting in a strategic position until the pig might show up there. So I don't want to say much more about um, the game and how it was solved. We will hear about that, as I mentioned, from the um, winning teams in just a few minutes. Um, one thing that impressed me personally a lot was to see the huge variety of approaches and strategies that um, teams tried out for this particular challenge. And our conclusion so far was that there was no obvious winning strategy. And I think moving forward, it will be really interesting to think about the various ingredients that made um, people be successful in this particular task and to understand how some of those might be combined into future more effective strategies for solving collaborative games. I just want to conclude my slides um, with a short um, uh, outlook. I think collaborative AI, so developing AI technology that can learn how to collaborate, especially with humans, has huge potential for transforming the way we currently think about how we interact with machines and what machines can do for us. So I think this is an immensely rewarding research area. And you happen to be in a position that is perfect for developing the next generation of collaborative AI technology. So I'd like to encourage you to think about those problems. And if there are any areas that you're particularly interested in, for example, in terms of creating new tasks for a future collaborative AI challenge, then come talk to me after this talk. Thank you so much.